curseless, out of orderless, weightless telephone. Strilger's switch was the key component of the unmanned exchanges that would enable the telephone system to spread. For the first time ever, you could dial directly from one phone to another. All you had to do was telephone. No one had to put you through. It was such a radical idea that in the UK at least, direct dialing had to be taught in helpful films like this. Now you hear the ringing tone, which synchronizes with the ringing in the house of the distant subscriber. Do not abandon a call without allowing a reasonable time for a distant subscriber to answer. Thanks to the Strouger switch, the telephone was able to conquer cities, countries and eventually whole continents. By the 1930s, the telegraph was dead. The telephone reigned supreme and for the first time was about to play a major role in the theatre of war. At the beginning of World War II, London was being bombed nightly by the Luftwaffe, so Allied command had to be secured deep below ground. Under Whitehall lay a nerve centre of communication that few people knew existed, and it was from here that the Second World War would be won or lost. And it was very nearly lost. Here in the cabinet room, the British government would meet safe from German bombs. There'd be Anthony Eden, Clement Attlee, Lord Beaverbrook, the Joint Chiefs, and here in the wooden chair at the head of the table, the great man himself, Winston Churchill. Late into the night, in an atmosphere laced with cigar smoke, they'd talk about the North African campaign, the Battle of Britain, the North Atlantic convoys, assuming everything they said was a secret. But it wasn't. There was an enemy in the heart of government, a mole so dangerous that the thoughts and strategies of Churchill himself were being delivered into the hands of the Nazis. It's incredible, really, when you think about it. This secret little room, in a secret place, full of people sworn to secrecy far below the streets of London. But there was just one weak link. That. Thanks to the telephone, precise details of the British war effort were being broadcast to the world, and no one in Whitehall realised what was going on. Churchill knew that reliable communication was vital to the outcome of the war, but it was one specific line of communication that was absolutely crucial to Churchill's plans. His regular transatlantic phone calls to President Roosevelt in America. The calls were all very hush-hush. Even the location of the prime ministerial telephone was a closely guarded secret. Had anyone seen Churchill preparing to call the president, they would have assumed something else entirely, because they would have seen him let himself into this unassuming room. It's a broom cupboard, disguised as a lavatory. On a telephone in this room, the first hotline to America, Winston Churchill would hold some of the most important calls in the whole of history. Unfortunately, he may as well have been standing outside with a megaphone because the Germans had a listening station off the Dutch coast and they could hear every single word he said. The trouble was, in the 1940s, the only way to speak across the Atlantic was by radio. So anyone with a listening device could tune in and hear the latest news about supply convoys, troop movements and vital new initiatives. When the Allied High Command eventually realised that Churchill was inadvertently telling Hitler everything, the Allies had to think big. The leak in Churchill's lavatory needed to be plugged, and quickly. So what they came up with was this, an encryption device called the Green Hornet. 
in nothing, great or small, large or The way the Green Hornet worked was deceptively simple. A recording of white noise made the phone call unintelligible. And then, on the other side of the Atlantic, an identical recording was subtracted, so the president could understand what Churchill was saying. The Green Hornet carried conversations about D-Day, Himmler's offer of surrender, and even Hiroshima. And with these phone calls secure, the outcome of the war became more of a certainty. The Green Hornet's encryption was so powerful that, unlike Enigma, it was uncrackable. Even today, the Green Hornet cannot be beaten. Churchill marveled at the fact that he could pick up the phone and have a completely secure conversation with someone on the other side of the Atlantic. Once, he remarked, it astounds me, nobody can tap the phone, it's completely impossible to do so. Progress perhaps is too fast, one wonders where we are heading. T minus ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. Lift off. We were heading, as it turned out, into space. As we all know, the space race brought with it all kinds of giant leaps for mankind, non-stick saucepans and Velcro, to name just two. But perhaps more importantly, it gave us something that the likes of Arthur C. Clarke had been banging on about for years. Global telephony using satellites. It sounded like piffle. But, in 1962, British technicians built a dish in Cornwall which could receive telephone calls from America via space with no wires. They called it Arthur, and it was a leviathan. In this case, size really did matter. The Cornish dish had to be big enough to track a tiny 3 foot by 10 foot satellite travelling at 35,000 miles an hour, 2,500 miles away. The satellite was called Telstar. On July the 10th, 1962, Telstar became the first telecommunications satellite to be launched into orbit, and Arthur was its UK receiving station. Just hours after the launch and with Arthur locked on, these were the first words to travel from America to Britain via space. Hello. Hello. Hello, Hello there. How's it sound to you? Very good, Todd May. Who's this speaking? With testing complete, it was over to the BBC for a more momentous and much more public second international phone call via satellite. Hello, is that, is that Alastair Cook in New York? Yes, it is. Uh, this is David Wilson. I'm speaking from the centre of London. Where are you in New York? Over the decades, hundreds of communication satellites have been sent up into space, and millions upon millions of miles of cable are buried in the Earth below. With every part linking together, operating in sync, the vast, largely invisible web of communication has now become the biggest machine in the world. Instant global communication is in full swing. Think what is flowing through this dish today. Good news from Australia, bad news from Argentina, no news from New Zealand. People listening to Muzak as they wait to be put through to Mr. Ong in Saigon. People talking to 0898 girls in California. Credit card transactions from the Caribbean, banking deals from Africa, the Indian internet. Trillions and trillions and trillions of ones and noughts every single hour of every single day. The telephone, with all its apparatus of mass communication, its satellites, its switches, its huge dishes and microwave technology, has clearly changed our world. 
But less obviously, the talking telegraph has apparently had its biggest impact on us at our most basic animal level. And it's created new kinds of scientists, photographers,